If, if you would describe Saul as a professional agitator, what would your reaction be to that, that description? That, that's okay with me. Uh, that's what I meant. Uh, you, you left out one word, Stubbs. Professional outside agitator. You see, you've got to be an outside agitator to begin with, because agitators very rarely come up from the inside. Because if you come up from the inside, one or two things happen to you. Either you get knocked off, you get co-opted. That's the reason all agitators are outside agitators. And, uh, you see, when you're out to really get change, every community, every place is organized. Uh, when sociologists talk about social disorganization or that communities are disorganized, that's yeah. what we're talking about. You can go into the creditiest community. It's got a policy racket going. It's got a syndicate out going. It's got a political organization that is crooked as hell. And they're, they're being exploited if it's a company town. But it's organized, you know? It's a contradiction in terms to say that there's such a thing as a disorganized community. So that the job of an agitator is first to... If he's going to, it's really not organizing a movement, he's reorganizing it. First, he's got to change the whole pattern. He's got to disorganize it. That's why he's an agitator. And after he disorganizes it, then he reorganizes it. So, we're coming to now something. Then this man who enters a community, this man, this outside quote-unquote agitator, has entered a community that's organized to begin with. That's right. And organized for what? And why is he there? See, this is organized for what? The community. Well, the community is organized on certain, a certain pattern of values. You can call it an exploitation of the money by the few over there. Call it whatever you want to. The organizer brings in another set of values. Now, to say that an organizer comes in who is just in there as sort of a blotter, that he's, he's, just, he, uh, he's going in for just participatory democracy. He doesn't have any ideas. He's just going to be a servant to the people of the masses, so to speak. He will just reflect what they want. It's just a lot of romantic crap. If an organizer doesn't have ideas as to how he wants to change that thing, and more important, if he doesn't have the sophistication and the experience to know how to get it done, see, there's a big difference between the what's that you want to get in life and the how you go about getting it. If you don't know the how about getting it, so you're, ne you're never going to get the what's. I always used to say that that uh, if, if any smart organizer had come up before the Oracle at Delphi, and the Oracle always sounded off with her usual proverbial uh, business of know thyself, you know, a smart organizer would look at her and say, okay, Oracle, now how the hell do I go about doing it? Don't tell me what I have to get. Tell me how to get it, because unless I know the how, the what is just rhetoric, you know? Uh, I imagine the Oracle would have had a fetch, you know? Would have said one question allowed only to a customer or something, yeah. get thee gone. Yeah. But our guy's just got to have ideas. If he doesn't have ideas, when he comes in there, the, if, if he doesn't know how and what to do, uh, the only thing that, he, that his presence does is where the population was, was say, 100,000 before he walked in, it now becomes 100,001. That's all. It doesn't make any difference there. He, he can only come in on the basis, really, of an invitation from the community. I go to Houston, I do nothing but to lecture at the University of Houston. I get at the airport, the whole clan is out there in full regalia. The mayor is all over the front page of the newspaper. He's going to investigate the university for inviting this radical down to speak to the university. The John Birch Society has got a mass picket line out there. The next morning, there's a big delegation of blacks inviting me to come in because they've never seen the, the, everybody they hate is so uptight. But now if you haven't got that kind of rep, you got to go about working your way in. And one of the basic things here is whether you really, I should stop and say this, does, that this is one field on which you cannot pull a con game or snow job. If you don't like people, they goddamn well soon know it. You know, you can pull a fast job if you're selling a vacuum cleaner or something. You're only going to be with the guy for an hour or selling him a house or a car. But when you're selling people and working with them, you're working with them for hours, for days, for weeks, for months. Sooner or later, they sense it, you know. So, if as long as you respect the dignity of people, then they will they'll respond to you. Now, that sounds like an old cliché, but as long as I respect you, for example, I can't come to you and say, now, studs, 
this is the way you get this thing done. Because what I'm really saying to you is, look, you, you dumb son of a bitch, you've been sitting around here for years, and i got to come along and tell you now, this is the way you get it done. So naturally, you're going to resent it. You see, freedom, freedom of choice, and freedom is a part of dignity, is really the right to make the choice. I go in our neighborhood. I run into you. You're on welfare, you know? You stand on the corner. So we get in our conversation. So I say, uh, where do you live? Over there. Well, where if you expect me to live? I'm on relief. Well, what do you want me to live in a 14 karat gold palace, you know? No, but Jesus, uh, you pay anything to live there? Oh, come on. Trying to be funny? Well, no, I don't want to be funny about Jesus. Uh, the place looks like it's loaded with rats and cockroaches, everything. You can damn well know what it is. Hmm. What would happen if you didn't pay your rent? What would happen? They'd throw me at my kids and everybody else. What do you mean? Yeah. What would happen if nobody paid their rent over there? Why, they'd... Oh, jeez, they'd have a little trouble throwing us all out, wouldn't they? Well, who is it invites you into a community? And perhaps you can be specific about certain ones you've been in. Who invites you in? I want to take Rochester, New York. <clears throat> they uh, they blow in a race riot in 1964. Until Watts blew the next year, it was the worst riot in the country. The National Guard was down there, a helicopter crashed, lives were lost, and so on. So the, uh, the Rochester Area Council of Churches, these are all the white churches, <coughs> including some of the blacks, respectable black churches. My answer to them was, oh, now wait, cool it. You know, we're not one of these uh, colonial operations like the Christian churches. You send your missionaries all over the country, all over the world, whether anybody asks for them or not. You haven't got business speaking for the black ghetto. We'll come in and organize, but we'll organize your white communities. But until the black ghetto asks us to come in, we're not coming in. So then the job starts very quickly. The papers went into an uproar. The front page editorials and stuff, in which they were saying that Polinsky comes in, that's the end of uh, peace and love. They had a riot the year before between ourselves and our black fellow Americans. Radio, every hour and the hour, they come out with, uh, with these uh, editorials. I mean every hour and the hour. So the blacks were reading all this stuff, and on top of that, uh, they had a statement. Uh, Malcolm X had been in Rochester just uh, three weeks before all this began. It was actually just about uh, six weeks before he got it. And he was asked a question by the leader of his forces in Rochester, what about Solinsky? And his, his answer was, use him, squeeze him dry, get him in here, learn everything you can, and then go on your own, yourself on it. So between Malcolm's statement and the white establishment just raising hell about me, next thing I knew, we had an invitation from every black church in the ghetto, every civil rights group, every street gang, and more than 13,000 individual signatures on petitions from a total population of 35,000. So if you took the kids out of the scene, you could say that every black in Rochester signed a petition inviting us in there. Now that's what I mean by an invitation. 